What's going on? What's crack a my peoples, my peoples? How you boy? I'm Jerry Quickly, and this is happening. So happy that you're here with us today. Uh, we are going to be spending this hour going over voter suppression and a range of other things. Um, before we get to all that, though, follow the money. I got to give props where props are due. Wall Street Journal's kicking some ass on this follow the money Trump story. Um, here's what we here's what we know outside of. Trump telling the his paramour, uh, who was a porn star, that she reminded him of his daughter, please get me a bottle of Listerine. Oh, I don't even like saying that, but oh, whatever. We're going to be going over all that and more. We're also going to um, check in with uh, Barbara Arnwine about what's going on with the new vo- voter suppression campaign that she just launched. And joining us live in studio is one and only uh, Mr. Greg Palace Friday. You made it all the way to the end of the week. The man or whoa, man, about to get the foot up off your neck. So happy you're here joining us today. Uh, We're spending this hour taking a deep dive on voter suppression. We're going to be taking your calls here as well at 818-985-5735. But before we really jump in, I want to introduce my first guest. I'm going to introduce my first guest with a quote from Esquire magazine. Greg Pallast is one of those inconveniently stubborn journalists, much like Glenn Greenwald and the late Gary Webb, who gets his teeth into a story and shakes it bloody right there in the middle of the parlor. Dreadfully inconveniencing the pampered swells of the elite political press and revolting the serious thinkers who get to go on PBS and moan about the genuine crisis of American political civility. That is how Esquire described my guest, Greg Palace, best-selling New York Times, New York Times best-selling author, Greg Palace, and also the force behind a release of his new updated film, The Best Boxing Money Can Buy, which was released on Amazon this week. You can find it there, and it's free on Amazon Prime, apparently, if you happen to be a member. Greg Palace, how are you? Welcome to This Is Happening. Uh, well, I'm just getting through this regime. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Trying to wade wear, through that's it. Why, that's why I wear a fedora, because of the feces falling there upon us <laughs> you can't I, I i have a helmet because my my head is soft um i want to first uh let's let's kick this off with um, a conversation that i had earlier today um with barbara arnwhite uh barbara is uh launched a campaign just two days ago in washington dc against voter suppression and i asked barbara uh about what she's doing and more importantly, in some ways, yes, or at least as important, the significance of the resistance. Let's give a listen. You know, Barbara, uh, I don't know if you're a big Star Wars fan, but I am. And I thought that when the Chris <laughs> Kobach Election Commission was killed, it was a bit like the rebel. The rebels took out the imperial base that was building the Death Star. OK, because that commission was a Death Star designed to take out black voting rights and voting rights of working class people and minorities across the country. Can you t- talk a little bit about the significance of that commission, whether or not it has been mothballed and what next steps are? Well, you know, people need to understand that you know, when um, President Trump started talking about three million illegals is why he lost the popular vote. Uh, you know, coming up with that whole excuse, talking about voter fraud, even during the campaign, as uh, you know, if he lost, it would be because of voter fraud. All of these crazy allegations. I think that you know it was setting up this entire framework for trying to justify more voter suppression in the states. You know, since 2011, there has been a national, state by state a movement for voter suppression to make it harder for people of color to vote uh, because, as you know, there are these people like Richard Spencer and Chris Kobach, sadly, has been associated with some of these groups that believe in white ethno states. They don't believe that, uh, that you know, multiracial democracy is a good thing. So they believe that this nation belongs to white people. And so you have that kind of backlash effect. But let's be clear that this is not just about race, because you also have people who have been passing laws to make it harder for students to vote, because they think students are, quote, too liberal. 
So in New Hampshire, they just passed a law in, you know, New Hampshire that barely has, you know, uh, any kind of real racial diversity. They just passed a law uh, saying that students, if they move into the state, have to, you know, register their cars, got to do all this stuff in order to vote. Uh, and will be blocked from voting if they don't. Uh, so these are, you know, really uh, very, very crazy laws. And why did they pass that law? They said because students are too liberal when they vote. They mm. vote too liberal. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is, you know, hostility towards immigrants, of course. Uh, but remember that if you, you can only vote if you're naturalized. But one of the things we've seen is a real, you know, uh, crackdown on naturalized citizens, which is what most everybody who's in the United States, except for those who came over here in the hold of slave ships against their will, everybody was naturalized uh, when they came to the United States in one form or the other. But you have seen this new imposition of of literacy tests where people are asking people to spell, you know, this and that, or they won't allow them to vote. It's been crazy. It's been a really a massive, you know, wave, and we've had to, you know, fight and get out there and do what we can. But also, guess who else is under attack? Who's that? The, there is this elitism theory about democracy. People should look at the writings of Matthew Vadim, who's one of the leading thought leaders for the uh, right. And what he's writing about is how low-income people should not be allowed to vote. Remember, this was debated way back in the 1700s <laughs> about, you know, the question about could you just only have elites and those who are property people uh, have the right to vote. And they lost eventually. And it ended up being that it wasn't just the landed gentry that had the right to vote, but all citizens had the right to vote. So it is fascinating to see how many uh, barriers there are based on elitism, racism, uh, ableism. I mean, look at the three million people who are disabled in our country who were blocked from voting in 2016. You know, we don't talk about all of these barriers that so many Americans are encountering, and they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. A democracy should be open. It should be accessible. It should be robust. It should involve every eligible citizen in its exercise. That's Barbara Arnwright and Arnwine, excuse me, and we spoke earlier today. Um, and my guest live here in the studio is the one and only legendary New York Times bestselling author Greg Pallas. He's also a filmmaker, and there is a brand new edition of his film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, The Case of the Stolen Election, that has been released on Amazon this week. Go check it out and cop it if you haven't seen it yet. Greg, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Uh Pretty tired, actually, I'm running sure. around the planet chasing uh, racists with uh, strange with ballots in their pockets. Um, by the way, that was a great Barbara Arnwine, for those who don't know, is the number one voting rights attorney in the United States. And uh, if and just so you also know, Barbara, with the Reverend Jesse Jackson, commissioned a special edition of my film. It's a, little, it's a bit shorter for showing at your organization and church. That's the main thing, the church, because the first words in my film are F U, <laughs> and then the second words are S whatever. Excuse me, a presidential term. Yes. and and the third is like you uh, redneck mother something. So th there's a church friendly version in which that in which the word um, happy face is is imposed. Mother trucker, right, and things like <laughs> so, that. But uh, anyway, for Barbara Arnwine and her transformative justice coalition and she is just with the reverend jackson for those who don't know has formed uh, a, basically a counter to what was trump's vote fraud commission called the presidential commission on election integrity he's not presidential there's no integrity in his commission and uh, they stole the election that's in the film and by the way this is the update including barbara arnwine's if you want by the way a copy of barbara arnwine's church friendly version Please go to gregpalace.com. Contact me. If you're going to show it, we'll, we will send it to you. I'm not kidding about right. that. And um, But the, the <laughs> uncensored version, which you can get, is new because the original version released before the election of the best democracy money can buy explained how Trump was going to steal the election by blocking 1.1 million 
voters of color from voting, how they did it, his henchman who put together the program, Chris Kobach of Kansas, remember that KKK, Chris Kobach of Kansas. This is the update which says, okay, you didn't pay attention. This time, listen. Now it's happened. It's the case of the stolen election. It's happened. Now pay attention. Because everyone was already bought their party dresses for Hillary's inauguration because they don't because understand. Because they're idiots. Because they really believe that yeah. what a, there was a mis- fundamental miscalculation by people who thought idiots who really believed through their racism and hubris that, you know what, we're going to foist a traditional candidate on the American people who represents nothing but the status quo. We're going to shove this candidate down their throats. And because Trump is so bad, these troglodytes will have no choice. These knuckle draggers will vote for Hillary Clinton because the alternative is unthinkable. And there was an assumption that they would actually let black folk vote because there's a Martin Luther King holiday, right? So that therefore... Wait, we can vote? (laughs) Because well, Prince, Principal Beaches Frank at all of Virginia High School 167 80, said, about, no, Jerry, you can never vote. About 84% of black people who are, who are properly registered to vote are allowed to vote. About 17% lose their vote for some cockamamie reasons, whether it's, as Barbara's talking about, this ID to say you are who you are, uh, or um, what we have in the film, this new system created by Chris Kobach called Interstate cross check. So these are all, you know, I want to get into Chris burning cross check. Yeah, <laughs> let's get in that right. I also want to remind our listeners that the entire my entire interview uh, with uh, Barbara Arnwine is available on SoundCloud. Just go to soundcloud.com slash TIH live. You can hear the whole interview. Please do. Um, I said to Barbara that the destruction of the Voter Suppression Commission that Trump had pulled together that was run by Chris Kobach, mm-hmm. KKK, um, was in fact uh, one of a remarkable victory of the resistance, and I equate it with the resistance destroying an Im- the the imperial base that was building the next Death Star. Is that am I just a wacky hippie um, who smoked too much pot when he was fourteen when he's watching this film, or is there relevance? Yes, you did, but it is. You are correct on one ground, then I'm going to give you the bad news. It's give just me the like, bad news, know, too. like Star Wars Part Two, Just like when they destroyed the Death Star, which is all I remember. But it lived from, on nonetheless. Which the is all I remember from that very boring movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Call me, whatever. Attack me. I, I kept falling asleep. But um, the Death Star was destroyed. Yes, the presidential commission was destroyed. It was kind of almost laughed out of existence by the mainstream press who said, ha, 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 they're talking about voter fraud, and there's no fraudulent voters. It's more likely, in fact, I actually looked up the statistics, it is definitely more likely to be hit by lightning than to be a, a, a voter who commits voter fraud in the, you know, by, uh, at the polling station, you know, being pretending to be someone else, or if after you died trying to vote, that type of thing. Um, it doesn't exist. But it's not funny because they're using that excuse to actually eliminate real voters. Almost always it's voters of color. And I have the evidence. It's in the film. It's in the book that goes with the film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. But here's the dark part of destroying it. And it was wonderful that that Death Star was destroyed. It was destroyed also for this reason specifically, besides the, the public laughter and derision, is that it was being peppered by a Barbara Arnwine and other attorneys, and including the single Democrat on the commission, who were demand uh, filed freedom of information requests, saying, "What's the agenda?" You know what? They wouldn't even tell the Democrat when they were going to meet. Right. They didn't tell him what the agenda was, and you know this his, is a guy. His role was just was to be kinda, there to say he was on the commission. Right. Without and by having the way, the guy was kind impact. of a schmuck. He actually liked Chris Kobach. He, he actually, to tell you the truth, he wasn't there to blow up the commission. He liked Chris Kobach. Wow. This guy was really weird. This uh, Secretary of State of, of Maine Dunlap, and he uh, so he actually gave uh, Kobach of uh, Chris Kobach of Kansas KKK the benefit of the doubt. And found out that he was being used as window dressing, and they didn't even tell him what was in the window. They wouldn't give him the agenda, so he was filing his freedom of information requests. So Kobach's idea was to go back to his original program, which he'd handed to Trump in a memo in January, um, just before the inauguration, in which he handed Trump a memo saying he wanted to create this operation, but within the Department of Homeland Security, so that when you're removing black Democrats from the voter rolls, you can say it's part of the war on terror, and therefore we don't have to respond to freedom of information requests. We can do this in the dark. 
because they operate like vampires when they're sucking the blood of the electoral system and removing black voters from the voter rolls and Hispanics and Asian Americans, and by the way, uh, American natives too. It's very a big and important key vote, just so you know, in key states. Um, when they do that, they wanted to do it in cover of darkness. Of course, because and they're, they're going to try to do it again. They are. But it's important that this one, that, that Death Star was blown up, but Darth Vader is still at the controls. That, that base building, the Death Star, was destroyed, but nonetheless, the Imperial staff of, officers continue to breathe air on our planet. Taking your calls here at 818-985-5735. Again, that's 818-985-KPFK. Do you have any questions about voter suppression? Lucky you. We have New York Times bestselling author and filmmaker Greg Pallast here to answer your questions about voter suppression. Um, you know, I, I can't help, but I really want to get into this uh, this Richard Painter clip that mm-hmm. I have. In this clip, um, mm-hmm. this is uh, this ex GOP official explains that the real scandal in the Stormy Daniels uh, story. Uh, Stormy Daniels is a is an uh, an actress who stars starred in adult films and uh, a former um, uh, paramour of Trump when he was married with a with a young baby. And uh, Richard Painter breaks down for Stephanie Rule on MSNBC exactly what the deal is. Um, spoiler alert, this is just my opinion. Stormy Daniels and her attorney were successful in effectively putting a gun to Trump's head, a metaphorical gun to end his political career. If, a, if a, an adult actress is able to put a gun to Trump's head and make him pay money in order to keep silent about something, I want to know how many other guns are pointed at his head because they're not all held by porn stars. Taking your calls at 818-985-5735, 818-985-KPFK. Let's give a listen to clip four here, where we hear from Richard Painter on MSNBC speaking with Stephanie Rule. Uh, you know, we have all these shell entities set up by Trump lawyers uh, and that's been a theme uh, that we've heard about uh, since before the election. He has an enormous number of entities that he has a financial interest in. Uh, and he alleges, of course, that these entities shield him from financial conflicts of interest under the ethics rules. Uh, it, it's his use of uh, uh, corporate shell entities uh, to accomplish whatever purpose he seeks, uh, whether it is uh, hush money for a mistress or it may be to receive unconstitutional payments from foreign governments uh, in violation of the Emoluments Clause or whatever uh, uh, other purpose. And uh, following the money is what's critically important. That's what Robert Mueller is doing and others are doing. And this shows uh, that uh, Donald Trump and his lawyers will uh, resort to all sorts of devious means to hide what they're doing. What they're doing may be legal in some instances, may be illegal in others, but there is absolutely no transparency with Donald Trump, the Trump organization, his family, or anything having to do with them. Uh, there is lots here to be very concerned about. But this use of shell entities uh, to funnel money in different directions, this pattern of conduct is one that Robert Mueller would be very interested in. But that's what I mean. I, I don't He's... think Robert Mueller or any of us here uh, care about the president or his sexual history. I mean, if exactly. there is money laundering, if there is hush money being paid, is this Stormy Daniels situation something that Robert Mueller and his team will look at? It's the pattern of conduct, the, the means used to create these shell entities to funnel money in different directions to accomplish what the president wants. Obviously, at the end of the day, he's not interested. I don't think Robert Mueller would be interested in the end recipient of this money uh, and uh, trying to uh, pay hush money to a porn star. But there may be other shell entities set up in a similar manner used to conceal money from Russia or from other sources uh, that are much, much more problematic. And uh, that's why uh, this is particularly informative that we see yet again uh, uh, the use of a very complex corporate structure uh, to uh, conceal what the president and his family are doing. Uh, We don't care about the sex, but we do care about a lot of other things, including money that could be coming in from foreign governments, whether it's the Russians or anyone else. And it's absolutely critical to get to the bottom of it. That means piercing through all of these corporate shells 
uh, following the money and finding out what's going on. Robert Mueller will be doing that, and Congress should be. And if Congress doesn't get their act together and start investigating what's going on with the Trump business empire, uh, they, uh, they have to be thrown out of there. They have to be thrown out because they refuse to investigate. I'm Jerry Quickly. This is happening, and we're taking your calls with Greg Palace, best-selling New York Times author as well as filmmaker. 818-985-5735 is the phone number, 818-985-KPFK. Uh, first up, let's talk to Samuel calling from Compton. Samuel, welcome to the show. What's the dealio? Samuel. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, listen, I Uber, right? I have my day job, and I Uber. And I swear, when I get into these topics, I tell people about voter suppression. I tell them about the best democracy money can buy, Greg Palace, man. I love you guys. And I always had I had to ask you this question before, Jerry. And, 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 um, and Greg, I'm asking you now, why can't they have you on uh, MSNBC or even NBC, Meet the Press? Why can't they have it? All right, hippie, I cut you off because you're making too much sense. <laughs> Answer the hippie if you want, Greg. I can't. You know, well, a few things I can tell you that there's whisper campaigns. One thing that they hate to discuss is a four letter word. They don't let me use a four letter word on those stations called R-A-C-E, race. So they'll talk about how there's no fraudulent voters and that, uh, you know, they'll talk about um, vote what they politely call vote suppression tactics. You know, if they stole your Uber cab... <laughs> You know, you wouldn't say they they suppressed my car. No, you'd say they stole it. So I, I, they don't like me saying that the vote's stolen, and they hate me saying, for example, that this is racially based. That they're using these tactics. Like I, in my film, I uncover cro- this system cross check. I've uncovered the fake felon purge of Florida. Well, it only worked because when Catherine Harris said that fifty six thousand Floridians were felons who couldn't vote, the important thing is that. The vast majority of the people that they wrongly accused of being ex-cons were black. And I wasn't guessing because it said BLA next to their name on the registration forms. I wasn't guessing about that. But they don't like me to talk about race in America and stealing the votes of black people. And I'm sorry I get to report that on in The Guardian. I get to report that in Rolling Stone. I get to report that on BBC and certainly on Pacifica and with uh, Jerry Quickly. But... God forbid you mention race, and I'll make an exception to it. I do get on Joy Reid's show on the weekends when the executives aren't watching. Right. Well, you, they, she slips you in there, but that's about it. The rest of them, pretty much it's a no-go zone for my friend Greg Powell's because yeah. he uses dirty words like race. 818-985-5735 is the phone number. That's 818-985-KPFK. Uh, next up, let's talk to John calling from Skid Row. John, welcome to the show. What's the deal, yo? Hey, Shalom. Hi, everybody. Hey. I love the show, Jerry. I love the show. And uh, Greg Powder, I love the movie. Thank you. Um, My question is, and, and I'm not a lawyer, but first off, the highest lawman in, in America is uh, actually the sheriff because he's sworn in, yeah. right? Why can't we use him and to swear out warrants on these jokers and start swearing out uh, because, like you said, the GOP is not going to do it. So why can't we swear out warrants for their arrest on the fact that they are fraud against uh, doing the public service? Okay. Well, thanks for the call. Appreciate hearing from you. That's so a good question. Posse uh, comitatus, are we bringing them back or not? Well, here's, here's our big problem, is that the sheriff in town, the attorney general, once was a guy named Robert F. Kennedy Jr. who used to arrest people who would stop people from voting because they were black. Right now, it's Jeff Beauregard Sessions, the kind of people that, that, that RFK used to bust. Right. So basically, unfortunately, it's, it's like having John Gotti uh, as the sheriff when it comes to voting. Jeff Sessions is a vote thief of the worst order in Alabama. And I was down in Alabama. In my film takes place. Uh, there's a lot of it in Alabama, and a uh, and a Harvard uh, a law graduate, Hank Sanders, Senator Hank Sanders, was removed from the voter rolls. He represents Selma, Alabama, but he couldn't vote. They said he couldn't vote because his name was just disappeared. And you know, it's not by accident that this is an African American. Right. Uh, you know, if it's a Harvard graduate at a country club who is white in. Um, you know, down in uh, in in Birmingham, I, I have there would be no who, problem. Los Angeles Country Club, their mm-hmm. families are, are members. They're quite wealthy. Um, they tell me that they're allowed to vote seventeen times each. 
<laughs> you know, basically for each hole in the golf yes. course. Exactly. Well, minus one, and that's for their friends that are already arrested. Right. You know, in my community, we just spill a little wine on the ground and say a drop for the brothers upstate. Yeah. Over there, 17 votes instead of 18. And, and by the way, you, you did have a, a Democratic senator just uh, uh, elected out of Alabama with a massive turnout of the women's vote and black women in particular. And what that was, be be aware, they can't steal all the votes all the time. So remember that. People are always, you know, one of the things that, that the Democratic Party hates and a lot of officials say, oh, Palace, you're discouraging people from voting because you're saying that their votes could be blocked or whatever. No, I'm saying they're stealing the vote from you because it's valuable don't give it away. You have to. You're going to have to uh, march, and that's what Hank Sanders, who lost his vote, but then fought for it, pounded the table, screamed, demanded a lawsuit, got his vote. But he he literally walked me over the the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, as he did with that he did uh, that march with Martin Luther King 50 years ago. He says, "You got if you think that that march is over, forget it." You got to keep going over that bridge. You know, and that means that you have to keep fighting and fighting. And sometimes you're going to have to fight the liberal Democratic Party to get your vote. You absolutely are. I want to. I want to. Um, well, first, I want to get out the phone number. Uh, let folks know we're taking your calls at 818 985 5735. That's 818 985 Jerry Quickly. 818 985 KPFK. I'm Jerry Quickly, and my guest is one and only New York Times best selling author. Greg Palace offering a whole range of inconvenient ideas, inconvenient for the mainstream, inconvenient for the status quo. His uh, new, brand new edition of his film, The Best Moxie Money Can Buy, is out on Amazon this week and on Amazon Prime. It's free if you're part of that corporate culture. Um, and we are taking your calls. Greg, I wanted to ask you about this ruling that came down mm -hmm. uh, just last week. Uh, for 35 years, approximately, um, the Republican Party had they had been engaged in behavior that was so egregious and so openly racist and hostile to people of color that they had been forced to operate under a consent decree from the courts. What the Republicans would do is in communities of color, they would station uh, armed, uniformed, off-duty police officers at voting stations to discourage people from coming to vote. It was so pervasive and so persistent as to be demonstrably provable. They were operating on a consent decree for some 35 years. Last week, it was lifted by an Obama-appointed, Obama-era appointed justice. How significant is the Republicans' freedom to start putting cops in black voting precincts it's, again? It's not just cops in the precincts. It's Real bad news, and and in a way, and I've, you know what? If the judge had seen my film, he because he said that he had no evidence, believe it or not, that the Republican Party had violated the consent decree, which says you cannot use tricks to harass black voters or remove the, or or unfairly challenge them. Thirty five years ago, they used a trick called caging, in which you send letters to black voters. And that you know won't be home. That is, uh, students at historically black colleges. Um, Black soldiers overseas, and when those letters come back because there's no addressee there, they're legitimate voters, but they're serving the country, you challenge their right to vote. Well, guess what? They, I caught them when I was working for BBC. I caught them doing that in Florida and Wisconsin and Alabama and other states. It's in my film. I was working. How with are you more effective than, the, than a sitting federal justice? How, what, you just got what the is available to you? <laughs> exactly. Why is it that you're able to find this? Openly available evidence, if you do the work, in Florida, Wisconsin, and other places, and a sitting federal judge, an Obama appointee, sat on his ass and came to a completely different conclusion. Or are you the hippie who's crazy and, in fact, there's nothing wrong? Well, the, the problem was is that the consent decree had to be defended by something called the Democratic National Committee. God help us. And the and DNC— Asked and answered. Okay, so the, Bobby Kennedy and I uncovered— it was a massive undercover investigation, by the way, where we got inside legally. I won't tell you how we got the we got the uh, the confidential memos of Carl Rove, who at the time was the uh, chief strategist for the uh, Republican Party. He was sending out thousands of letters to soldiers, uh, African American and Hispanic soldiers at the Jacksonville Naval Air Station. We have the list of the people they challenged. They called it the caging list. I uncovered it. I broadcast they it. They literally called it the, the caging, caging they list. They called it what it is. What it is, the caging list. They uh, We put it on 
the top of the BBC Nightly News, front page of the Guardian newspapers. I put it in Rolling Stone with Bobby Kennedy, and yet the DNC would not act on this and go to the judge and say, here's a clear, here is a clear in-your-face violation of the consent decree. They are targeting African-American soldiers, for God's sake. They go, they send the letters to their home address where they're legally, at the Naval Air Station, where they're legally allowed to vote absentee because they're in Fallujah. Right? So go to Iraq, lose your vote, mission accomplished. That's what they were doing. And I have to say, he was slow to do it, but John Kerry finally <laughs> finally said, yeah, that's why I lost. And yeah. um, But I got to tell you, he wasn't in court. The DNC will not bring up the issue of race in America and race, racism in voting. Which is exactly why they're, they're completely worthless. You're worthless, DNC. You are without value because you turn your backs on black voters. What makes you better than common pond scum? I'll tell you, common pond scum has a purpose. 818-985-5735, 818-985-KPFK. Uh, next up, uh, let's talk to Morris calling from Long Beach. Morris, welcome to the show. What's it doing? Hey, GP, what about this? We're going to try to circumvent the voting machines, right? ESNS. The vote in Sequoia. Now, what if all of our people that are voting decided to go with a write-in candidate? Okay, we now, and of course, on the propositions, we got to punch the machines. I got that. But let's say we want, like, Jerry Quigley for governor or something like that, and we get, like, 90,000 people to write in. <laughs> Wouldn't that circumvent the voting machines? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's oh, a great, great question. Okay, question. Let's have next, our expert next, answer. Next, Greg? Next. <laughs> uh, no, okay, I'll give you, here, here's the problem. If you think they haven't thought of this stuff, you're <laughs> No, understand, you're talking about people who really spend day and night figuring out how to shaft you out of your vote. And let me give you an example about the write-in idea that lost. In San Diego, okay, the, uh, the woman running, Donna Fry, was running for mayor as a write-in candidate. There was no Democrat, by the way, on the ballot, just a Republican. He was running unopposed. She had a write-in campaign. They count all the ballots, and she won with a write-in campaign. But then the GOP said, wait a minute. It, when you write in the candidate's name, there's a bubble next to the name. And, and 5,000 people who wrote in her name didn't fill in the little bubble. And so a GOP judge said, oh, throw out all the ballots of people who didn't fill in the bubble because, get this, we don't know the, their intent in voting for mayor. These are people who wrote out her name. She said some people even because her, you know, uh, her husband, Skip Fry, was the world's number one surfer. So a lot of people called her surfer girl. But so they threw out all the surfer girl ballots. But the ones that had her name, they wouldn't allow those votes to count. So in other words, they're going to come up with tricks with tricks. They discounted every Like, like what happened in, in, in Virginia. Right. I yeah. mean, you had you have yeah, a that's... Democrat who uh, who. I'm not even clear that it was a t- that that it was a tie at all. She won. They found a way to invalidate. I mean, what? Explain to our audience what happened in Virginia and why it was foul and rotten. Okay, what happened in Virginia? First of all, that was a state where they used this evil system called cross check, where they're removing they removed seventy nine thousand voters before the election, uh, saying that they were people who were registered in two states to vote. People with names like James Jackson, Harold Washington. Uh, Jose Garcia and others, basically common names. My they fam. removed a lot of uh, removed a lot of voters of color who were blocked at the polls. Uh, so you already begin with a thumb on the scale. Then it came down to uh, then they disqualify a lot of ballots all, all the time in in Virginia. Tons they call it spoilage. But then the GOP found one ballot that was spoiled, and they tried to make a case. Wait a minute, we want that one adjudicated because there was one legislative race which was won by a Democrat by one vote, even after all the games that they played, by one single vote. And so they found a, a ballot that had been thrown out because it couldn't be read. It had multiple marks on it. And they said, that's a Republican ballot. So they got they they ran around till they found a judge that would say, oh yeah, that's a Republican ballot that made the 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 legislative race a tie. So then they pulled a they had. But the two- Democrats weren't allowed to protest the fact that the Republicans say, hey, we found another legitimate ballot. Right. The judge said, yes, that's a legit ballot, and allowed it without any hearing or protest whatsoever from the Democratic candidate or right. a party. So then they picked out a name out of a bucket. And believe it or not, the Republican won, and and that one, that game with one vote gave the Republicans, kept the Republicans control of the Virginia legislature. Otherwise, it would have gone Democratic by that single 
vote that they uh, that they put in, made it, created a tie, and pulled it out of a bucket. Now, I want to punch someone in the face right now. I don't know who, but I want to punch <laughs> someone in the face. So we have in the film. I have a funny kind of animation about it because you know, some of it's kind of goofy, even though it's horrific. See, but you know, in the film, I don't want everyone to cry. So I tell, I have a whole cartoon sequence about how 2.7 million votes are thrown in the electoral dumpster. And guess what? According to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, when I had them, when I challenged this fact, I said 2.7 million votes that were not counted. Okay. Not counted. The chance your vote will be spoiled that is not counted for a technical reason, like the machine wouldn't read it, some junk, um, is 900% higher if you're black than if you're white. And it's not, by the way, because black voters don't know how to vote and, and, you know, make paper airplanes out of their ballots, Jerry. I'll tell you what happened. It's in the new version of the film in Michigan, right? Michigan was the key to Trump's so-called victory. He won by 10,700 votes. 75,355 ballots were never counted. Where were those ballots cast? In two cities, Detroit and Flint. What color are those cities? Blue, that is Democratic, black cities, right? Why were 75,355 ballots not counted? That's six times Trump's supposed margin of victory. Okay, black votes not counted. The answer was... 87 machines broke down and couldn't read the ballots. They have scanners. It's paper ballots, but they put them in machines, and the machines didn't work. Why didn't the machines work? So you got to keep digging into this stuff, as I did. I went to Michigan. You'll see in the film. Um, the 87 machines didn't work. In the Detroit is Wayne County. The African-American woman who is in charge of Wayne County voting told the state of Michigan, Remember, Detroit and Flint are bankrupt. They are not controlled by the electorate. It's not a democracy. These are the occupied territories of Michigan. The Republican governor appointed a manager mm-hmm. over Detroit and no a more manager democracy. over Flint. Okay, the, it's not the voters. And the manager says, listen to this. We don't have money for new machines. So believe it or not, they We don't have money for you Negroes to vote. vote. So they literally put in machines they knew, 87 machines, they they knew were broken. They couldn't record the votes. And so they said, gee, we don't know how the, how the African-Americans... Okay, now I'm have... definitely going to punch <laughs> someone in the face, Greg. You're robbing no, no, no. me. You're robbing me off. <laughs> so no, what you got, the reason I'm laughing is because it's... Otherwise, I'd be crying every minute. Oh, my Look, God. Look, the thing is, and please don't take this as the reason not to vote. It's the reason to vote. It's because they don't want you to vote. They don't want you to vote. So you're going to vote just... That's the punch in the face. Right. They, they basically want to disenfranchise you, and they want to basically take the spirit out of you. It's so broken. Yeah, you should, you should leave this right. to, and, and they leave can't, this to you others. Know, it's very important that they can't steal all the votes all the time. It's really, really important to understand that. Because, you know, uh, my co-writer in Rolling Stone, Bobby Kennedy, um, he, um, he could do something I can't. He could call uh, Obama on his BlackBerry, which he did. And he said, well, what about, you know, do you know what's going on here? And, and Obama knew the whole thing. I wish he'd used his his Justice Department to to stop it. But his response is basically, well, if they're going to steal, we figured about 6 million votes. He said, well, then we're going to get 7 million more votes. Now, that's what he had to do. He had to, like, have such crushing victories in 8 and 12 that he overwhelmed the steal. So it can't. He was smart enough to do the math and say, like, okay, we know they're going to steal these votes. How do we must generate that much more? It can be done. You know, and it's going to they're going to come at you every single time. After all, this African-American lawyer, Hank Sanders, became some Alabama's state senator, which is extraordinary. Yeah. But then they took away his vote, even though he states he's a senator who has no right to vote now because they. OK, Greg, now I want to punch someone else in the face. No, no, no. But Greg, get out. Got, just get out. He says, Taking work, your work. calls. I just heard from him today. He says he's in oh, the film, by the way. Unbelievable. He'll, he'll tell you to work to keep going at it. He's going at it. He's 75. We're taking your calls at here at 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. Uh, next up, uh, let's talk to Susan calling from South Bay. Susan, welcome to the show. What's the dealio? Hi, and hi, Greg. Have you see Eileen Proctor tell her I said hi? I absolutely will. Um, I, okay. And thank you so much for your work. It's uh, majorly important. I Thanks went so to much. Florida to get out the vote for after the um, uh, uh, for the Carrie Edwards campaign. Uh-huh. And what I said 
was you could not have believe you could not have worked on that campaign and believed that Kerry wanted to win. Uh, he was just too smart. Uh, I was in the Kennedy Space Center area, and um, hold on, let me. I just need to turn this music off here. Okay. Um, and, Maybe we um, like it. Maybe we should turn it up and we'll dance, Jerry and I. <laughs> Subtext. Yes, it's it happening good. now. A, a wonderful Brazilian group called Brasiliando. <laughs> Um, but, uh, they, uh, yes. they, they hired somebody who had not even, and this was after they had disenfranchised all the African-American voters in the Gore campaign, and they hired this guy who in four months had never even talked to, had no idea who the, uh, head of the local NAACP was in a majorly important district. Uh, it was just astounding. And one of the other weird things was they had this big, you know, Democratic meeting before um, I left, and the, there was one of the Swift Boat, one of the friends of Kerry, mm -hmm. who was a, a, for, with, um, speaking up against the Swift Boaters for Truth, and but he talked about how that that guy. Um, sorry, too many thoughts at once. Yeah, okay, no, I get your idea that that Kerry's people were no, not but what fighting. What was weird, the, Greg, was yeah. he didn't allow the press in to hear that the the guy who started Swift Boaters for Truth was such a hot dogger that nobody wanted to ride with him. Okay, well, here, here's here, look. Here's the deal. Okay. Um, what you're saying is that Kerry didn't fight, but what he what they're not fighting for, and and by the way, I I was with uh, John Edwards and and uh, Jesse Jackson and Edwards privately, and I'm sorry, if I I guess he won't mind me saying this. He was fuming at Kerry. They weren't dealing with the issues of the suppression of the black vote, and he called Kerry from uh, from uh, Reverend Jackson's office. I was with him and said, "Listen, you're going to speak before the NAACP. You got to talk about the non-count of the black vote and the fact that we have registration drives, and you're, we're finding that." as many as 54% of the names we get in registration drives aren't even put in the voter rolls. And so, you know, Jesse Jackson's gathering 2 million names. A million are not, are not being entered on the voter rolls. Things like that. The non-count. And, um, and, and, yeah, Kerry said a few nice things to the NAACP because that was the audience to talk to. But after that, the issue disappeared. It is very difficult. The Democratic Party did not want to touch this issue. Part, there's all kinds of reasons. Isn't I can't this a always continuation? Uh, really, in many ways, what I was saying about Hillary Clinton, that the Democrats continue to put foist these old, wealthy, white candidates on us that represent the status quo, and they don't. And the status quo is to not talk about race and not talk about the horrific impact of racism on our elections, the electoral system, and voter disenfranchisement. And the Democrats are just as guilty for supporting that miasma as the Republicans are. The blood is not just on the hands of the Republicans. The goddamn Democrats are guilty, too. Well, I don't want to say it's equal. I never want Not to say it's equal. Not equal. No, the Republicans are far worse, but the Democrats are also guilty. Yeah, and one of the problems is, and you'll see it in my book, and, uh, and, uh, which is that the Democrats, unfortunately, use some of these same tactics, but yet against the same people, that is voters of color. Because you have to understand, places like New Mexico, where you have a majority of the, of the voting population are voters of color. So how do you have a Republican governor? The answer is that the Democratic establishment, Bill Richardson, a so-called Hispanic Democrat, and his, uh, hench and, his, and his henchmen and henchwomen in New Mexico, the elite of New Mexico, um, they were so busy knocking off the votes of poor Mexicanos and uh, Pueblo uh, natives that they ended up basically gutting the Democratic Party and the uh, Republicans is kind of like dance right in because there is a re war within the Democratic Party between the elite, the corporate elite, and the base. And so the, the same vote suppression tactics used by Republicans against African Americans and Hispanics is used by the, Repu by the Democratic establishment in many states. So you end up with the same effect with the same victims. And therefore, because their hands are covered with blood themselves, right. the party of Jim Crow um, still 
is very uncomfortable taking on the uh, Republicans for doing it in a in a worse, more uh, widespread and, they're, they're not and in a horrific position. manner. And they're not in a position to take on the Republicans because of the racism in the Democratic Party. No, the Democrats are not as bad as Republicans. What the f does that mean? That's not even saying anything. Oh, you're 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 not as bi- you're not quite as bad as Himmler. I disapprove of you, but you're definitely not as bad as Himmler. The fact that they're talking about you in the same sentence using the 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 the, the person Himmler. That's the problem. Except that we have one problem is that it is it's not minor. And again, I you know, after here I just told you about the Democratic Party's, you know, telling about to the, their dirty underwear. But I want to tell you, when you got a guy like Chris Kobach of Kansas being the point man for Trump, he stole a million votes for Trump to win that election, supposedly for Trump. And I'm not talking about the uh, it, Trump losing the the popular vote. He lost. He lost Michigan. He lost Wisconsin. He lost Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, Arizona. I could go on. When I looked state Trump by state, Trump lost all these states. If that... you really l- counted all the votes that were cast and allowed those people whose votes were blocked and had allowed them to vote, Trump would not be president. Whatever you think of Hillary or not, and I try not to think of her. Uh, but whatever you think, it's about the democracy. And Chris Kobach of Kansas, okay, one of the tricks he has, and understand what's coming up here, guys. Now, I do it as a funny c- cartoons in my – I got the guy who, who drew Who Framed Roger Rabbit do cartoons for my movie. So it's so some of it's funny because you have to laugh. Otherwise, you're going to cry. I can't have you cry through the whole I thing. don't believe in humor, Greg. You, Please you'll, continue. You'll cry at the end, but, the, you know, not all the way. You'll get laugh. But the thing is we got – he's talking about – a million aliens who voted for Hillary Clinton and that are on the voter rolls to vote for Democrats. You know, so we have a, a, a spaceship landing and, and little aliens coming out wearing um, sombreros that say Hillary on them. And the thing is, what they are talking about, you say, oh, you can laugh it off and say there aren't a million aliens swimming the Rio Grande to vote in our school bond uh, elections. Here's the danger. Chris Kobach wanted to use the Department of Homeland Security to because it has the the deportation order so it has a list of all the names of people deported believe it or not they have names like jose hernandez right and so then they find a jose hernandez on the voter rolls of florida and they say oh well that must be jose hernandez he swam back from uh, guatemala to vote in the florida elections because obviously there's only one jose hernandez and after all it's not a common name for a republican uh, you might think that that's ridiculous, but they actually tried to do that. Obama, I will say, did stop them. The state of Florida, and this is in the book and in the film, 181,000 uh, sp- Hispanic voters, their right to vote was challenged by Republican Governor Rick Scott, 181,000 as so-called potential alien voters. Mm. They were and thousands were because required, they had Spanish surnames right, or thousands Asian were required surnames to or... go into and Asian Americans who, by the way, vote as if they've turned black. Um, you know, seventy five percent of Asian Americans voted Democratic, so they're going after these the Hispanics and Asian Americans in particular and de- demanding that they prove they're citizens. We don't we're not uh, red China. We don't have citizenship cards, but you're supposed to prove you're a citizen. And by the way, that means taking off a day of work to go to a court. To, right. to say that I'm an American, because just because your name's Jose Hernandez, this was no joke. Okay. In the uh, end, now, by the way, just so you know, out of 180,000 voters that they challenged, they did find and convict one single alien voter, a Republican from Austria. Wow, Republicans. They can't be trusted, those Austrian Republicans. <laughs> Uh, Navikin Um Let's, uh, we're going to try to squeeze in one call real quick. One more call here. Let's talk to Andres calling from Riverside. Andres, 30 seconds of light. What's the dealio? Thank you for taking my call, Jerry. Um, real quick, uh, this whole conversation has been really interesting. The thing is that uh, a lot of us aren't surprised, or at least a few of us aren't surprised of, of these tricks that they play. This is what they do in the back rooms. This is what they do to have fun. You know, for those of you that are surprised about it, 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 it you know, you got to catch up. Right. But it's getting worse, man. It's getting, thanks for calling, Andres. Appreciate hearing from you. Um, it, am I, am, should I really just migrate to the decaf? Um, you know, is it, is, it, is it the caffeine or is it the political landscape? Are we in a new zone that we have never been in before? Yeah, there's or a new just ugly. media people like there, me there's an, making too much of it? This, and it's not an accent. On, on June 25th, 2013, this last election was the very first one 
that was held after the end of the, the destruction of the Voting Rights Act. And Trump and Chris Kobach of Kansas, Mr. KKK, went right in there and took stole it because they were, basically the law to protect you had just gone poof. Wow. Um, I really want to thank my guest, New York Times bestselling author and filmmaker Greg Palace. Brand new edition of The Best Democracy Money Can Buy came out on Amazon this week. Greg, thank you so much for being here.